The book of Genesis is history. Chapters 1 to 11 is primitive history. It covers creation, the fall, the flood, and the dispersion. Chapters 12 to 50 is patriarchal history. It covers Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. There is no one who will argue that chapters 12 to 50 are not historical. No one will argue that. And my thesis this morning and going forward is then neither should anyone argue that chapters 1 to 11 are history either. They are. The book of Genesis is such a critical book. Not just to the matter of creation, but also it is a critical book to all of human life. It is critical to how we think and how we live. It is critical to how we understand ourselves, how we understand humanity, how we understand our existence, and how we understand our destiny. Genesis is such an important book that if life was a multiple choice exam consisting of only one question, that question would have only two options. The first one would be to believe what Genesis says, especially chapters 1 to 11, or to reject what Genesis says, especially chapters 1 to 11. There is no option C. You know, some people say there's an option C called theistic evolution. Neither is there an option D. Some people call it progressive creation. Both of those compromises deny what Genesis actually says. And what it says is that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's just a short little phrase, a short little verse, ten words. But this little verse is so precise and so profound, it almost defies human comprehension. Who is Herbert Spencer? Herbert Spencer was a scientist who died in 1903. His main contribution to science was that his proposal or was his proposal that all reality, absolutely everything that exists in the entire universe can be contained in five categories, which I have on the screen behind me. Time, force, action, space, and matter. His theory is that there is absolutely nothing that exists that is outside of these five categories. That was a proposal he made in the late 19th century, and to this day, everyone agrees with him. There is no debate, and it is extremely unlikely that there will ever be any debate with Herbert Spencer on this. So with that in mind, I'd like us to look at Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, there's time. God, there's the force. Created, there's the action. The heavens, there's space. And the earth, there's matter. There it is. There it is. Everything that could be said about everything that exists is already contained in the very first verse of the Bible. To believe, Genesis 1 verse 1, has far-reaching implications. Implications that lead to human dignity or the opposite. Implications that lead to human flourishing, or the opposite. Implications that lead to human rights, liberty, morality. Furthermore, to believe the book of Genesis leads to the promotion of the highest levels of civilization, the highest levels of culture. Why is that so? Because Genesis says that man is created in the image of God. That Genesis fact alone automatically leads to things like advancements in medicine, education for all, marriage, family life, peace, and much, much more. On the other hand, to reject what Genesis says, to in fact believe that man is merely an evolved creature and a product of chance, to believe that automatically leads to the opposite set of scenarios. For example, without a creator God and without understanding that man is made in the image of God, suddenly human dignity is at risk of disappearing. 
And the door opens now without a creator God and without an understanding that man is made in the image of God. Suddenly the door opens to things like abortion, infanticide, euthanasia, ethnic cleansing, and much more. Without a creator God and without an understanding that man is made in God's image, morality disappears. Because morality cannot be explained without God. The door suddenly opens now to every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. Harvey Weinstein unleashed around the world. No wrong, no right, no good, no bad, no truth, no beauty, no justice, because there is no God to be the foundation of all of these. Without a creator God and without man made in the image of God, human flourishing slows down and almost vanishes completely. We've um, spent all our attention on the 500th anniversary of the Reformation last month, but there was another anniversary. Do you remember it? The, rev- the anniversary, 100th anniversary of the Communist Revolution last month. That was an experiment in national atheism. It lasted for 72 years, and those who are on the inside of that experiment know that it was 72 years of death, 72 years of darkness, 72 years of domination, and 72 years of repression in a society that said there is no God. The word Genesis itself means origins, or it means beginnings. And that's exactly what the book of Genesis is. It is God telling us about the origins of a great many things, more than you would believe at this moment. But 10 minutes or 15 minutes from now, you're going to say, I didn't realize all of those things found their origin in Genesis. This one you know about. God informs us, or Genesis rather, informs us about the origin of the universe. You knew that. But we must understand how unique this is. This is unique compared to all other literature, all other science, all other philosophy, all other religion. Every other explanation of the universe from ancient religious mythology to modern scientific models, all other explanations start with what already exists. They start with the universe as it is. Only the book of Genesis starts with nothing but an eternal God. It is unique in giving us the origin of the universe. Genesis informs us about the origin of order and complexity. Our universal observation is that the universe that we live in is orderly, fantastically orderly. It runs on fixed rules and laws and constants that are so precise and astonishingly complex. Where did that complexity come from? What a great question to pose to those who don't believe. Where did this complexity come from? How often have you ever observed order and complexity arising spontaneously? Has anyone ever seen it arise spontaneously? Let's see. No, never. Never do Boeing 747s spontaneously emerge after a hurricane strikes a junkyard. That's just not what is left behind. Children's playrooms, when you release a one-year-old and a two-year-old into that playroom, it doesn't spontaneously organize itself. It's chaos afterwards. Order and complexity are caused. They're programmed. They are generated by some outside influence. And the book of Genesis introduces us to the one who brings order and complexity. Genesis informs us about the origin of the solar system, not just the earth, but the sun and the moon and the planets and the stars. Genesis tells us that Almighty God created them all. Genesis informs us about the origin of the atmosphere and the hydrosphere. The earth as you know, 
is uniquely equipped with abundant supply of water and also a protective blanket of oxygen, nitrogen, gases, both of which are necessary, absolutely necessary, for life. And though scientists continue to search all throughout this solar system and as far as they can shoot rockets, it has never shown up anywhere else in the known universe. And no other story, no other tradition, no other religion, no other explanation accounts for these special features which provide the environment for life, except for Genesis. Genesis informs us about the origin of life itself, the infinite complexity that is programmed into everything that exists, plants, Trees, a blade of grass, animals, birds, fish, insects. None of these can be explained apart from the special creation of some superior, supernatural intelligence. I read that every single human cell, and of which we have trillions in our body, trillions of cells, every single human cell has enough genetic information to fill 1,000 books of 500 pages each. Where did that information come from? Genesis explains it. Genesis informs us about the origin of man. According to Genesis, man is the pinnacle of God's creation. It's the last thing that he created. The most highly organized, the most complex being in the entire universe that he made. Physically, we already know that man is fearfully and wonderfully made. How many of you are fearfully and wonderfully made? Hands up. Yes, it's unanimous. We all are. We are a physical feat of engineering. We are magnificent physically. We are intricately balanced physically with numerous very complex systems that are working together while you're sitting there, and they're working together seamlessly and quietly operating in the background, but they're working perfectly. Besides the physical wonder that a human being is, there are the abstract wonders. For example, your ability to think and contemplate and reason. Your ability to appreciate and be thankful. Your ability to be self-aware that you are sitting here and you're not sitting somewhere else. You are awake. You're conscious. This self-awareness this ability you have to understand abstract things like beauty and love and to worship and to uh, know the difference between good and evil. Only Genesis gives us an account explaining the origin of these wonders of the human being. Genesis informs us about the origin of marriage. Throughout time and in every culture, you will find marriage and family life. Why is it found everywhere throughout all time and all cultures. And why is it ideally monogamous? We all know that sometimes it's not. But why is it ideally monogamous? Why is it ideally patriarchal? Why is it ideally one man, one woman, till death do them part? Well, that's because that's the way Genesis says it was ordained by the Creator. All of the aberrations that we have to marriage and family life, anything that is different from polygamy to promiscuity to divorce to infanticide to abortion to homosexuality to transgendering, all of these things develop after the fall. And all of these things are corruptions of God's initial plan and his initial order. Genesis explains that. Genesis informs us, furthermore, about the origin of evil. We learned that evil is a temporary intrusion into God's perfect world. It is allowed by God as a concession to the principle of human freedom and human responsibility. Now that is a mouthful. But Genesis presents that mouthful in a profoundly simple, sweeping narrative that a child can learn about in kid zone, and that a learned theologian or philosopher can write a 2,000-page volume about. 
Genesis also includes information that evil does not win. Evil will not win and evil cannot win because there is a greater good that is coming in the person of a God who stoops down to redeem sinful people. Very relatedly, Genesis informs us about the origin of judgment on evil. Evil is not allowed to continue without consequence. We learn that evil is judged. We learn that evil is punished and that the wrath of God against evil is already set in motion. And where is the origin of it? In Genesis. Genesis informs us about... That's right. (laughs) Genesis informs us about the origin of salvation by grace alone. Now that sounds familiar, does it not? Genesis shows us that God is merciful to Adam and Eve, even after they sin against him. God doesn't destroy Adam and Eve, even though they deserved it. Instead, he develops a system of animal sacrifice. The animals taking the place to die on behalf of the sinners, and then God providing mercy. This is the origin of God's plan of redemption. Step by step, that leads ultimately to Christ himself, who is also mentioned in Genesis as the seed of the woman, the coming Messiah and Savior, who will come to crush the serpent's head. Incredibly, the plan of redemption is also there in the book of Genesis. Genesis informs us about the origin of language. It reveals God as a communicating God. God created man in his own image, and so guess what? The communicating God gave us the ability to communicate as well. Communicate with one another, but also communicate with God. And to the question about how it is that so many different languages exist on the earth, Genesis explains that too at the Tower of Babel. Genesis informs us about the origin of nations. Starting with the Tower of Babel, God takes one race and he scatters them all over the world. There is no other source, neither ancient nor modern, that explains why it is that we have so many different people groups scattered all around the earth with different languages and different cultures. But that explanation is found in the book of origins in Genesis. Genesis informs us about the origin of government, the earliest systems of human government, along with laws, along with punishments for violating those laws, are found in Genesis. Genesis informs us about the origin of civilization and culture, urbanization, metallurgy, music, agriculture, farming, writing, education, navigation, textiles, ceramics. They all find their start in the book of Genesis. Genesis informs us about the origin of religion. Yeah, that's right. In the book of Genesis, there's true religion and there's false religion. They both appear here in the book of Genesis. And Genesis informs us about the origin of the chosen people, Israel. Now, what is Israel? Israel. Yes, it's God's chosen people. But what's the purpose of that? Well, God's chosen people are God's chosen pipeline to provide divine revelation to the world, to reveal his covenant, his prophets, his writings, his wisdom. It all shows up in Genesis, the book of origins. So now you know why the book of Genesis is so important. And now you know why the Genesis question is such a massive question. With Genesis and accepting Genesis, we have an infinite, personal, loving God. Without Genesis, we only have matter. And to make matter worse, that matter doesn't matter. With Genesis, we have an entire universe that is lovingly created by God for a specific purpose. Without Genesis, we have a universe that was created by chance, 
without any purpose at all that will ultimately lead to the most destructive of horrors. With Genesis, we have man created by God, in the image of God, loved by God. Without Genesis, we have man who is the product of time and chance. We have man, the greatest fluke you could ever imagine. Without Genesis, or with Genesis, sorry, we have morality. With Genesis, we have morality that's defined by God, defined and based upon his unchanging, holy character. Without Genesis, we have morality that's defined by the individual where every man does whatever is right in his own eyes. With Genesis, we have an afterlife that involves either eternal life with God in heaven or eternal separation from God in hell. Without Genesis, we have an afterlife that consists of personal extinction for everyone. So a person's view of Genesis is by no means a secondary issue. It is by no means an optional thing for Christians to buy into, like getting power windows on your car or air conditioning. Genesis actually is the engine that drives our very understanding of the universe. But today you and I live in a world that is dominated by what? Evolution. Permeating every area of society, touching every part of secular life. Evolution, the new standard on how the physical world is viewed and understood. It has a foothold in biology, in chemistry, even to the social sciences, even to psychology and to philosophy and everything in between. And frankly, it's absolutely amazing that the secular world clings with such tenacity to a theory that is unbelievable. A theory that is full of holes. This is why I'm looking forward to Clarence Jansen next week. A theory that is full of holes. A theory that is so implausible as to be even absolutely impossible. And yet people cling to it like a life raft. The question that occurs to all of us is why? Why do people cling with such tenacity to evolution? Well, of all the difficult questions that we can look at today, that particular question is an easy question. Because many will cling desperately to the theory of evolution in order to do what? Avoid Avoid God. Push him out of their lives. Avoid his law. Avoid his standards. Avoid his will. Avoid his word. Avoid his judgment upon their lives. It's a title of a book here. Henry Morris, wonderful theologian who wrote this book back in the 1980s called The Long War Against God. And he documents this very thing. Scriptures, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. To be foolish is to be irrational. To be irrational is to be foolish. It is an irrational thing to reject an intelligent, all-powerful creator when the evidence is all around us. It is irrational to neuter an all-powerful creator while at the same time, empowering this thing called chance as the driving force behind the universe. Why do people do it? Why do so many people do it? Well, the Bible says that it is truth suppression. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Why does the truth have to be suppressed? Because God made it so that truth is obvious. Truth is obvious. The very next verses say, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. And so they are without excuse. The truth about a creator is obvious. Here, consequence always demands 
a cause. The universe is the consequence. A cause is demanded. Movement demands a prime mover, an originator of that movement. Creation demands a creator. The truth about a moral God is equally obvious. Humans, all humans, have a sense, a strong moral sense, a strong moral conscience, even if they ignore it, even if they ignore it, even if they bury it, even if they stomp on it and try to get rid of it, they still have it. They still have it. This moral conscience. Evolutionary theory is at a loss to explain this sense of morality. Evil and good, right and wrong, justice and injustice, these things have no explanation within the world of evolution. The truth about God's invisible attributes is also obvious. And it takes, seriously, it takes a fool to deny it. One thoughtful look at, the, at a hurricane. I, uh, during the recent hurricane season, I enjoyed going onto YouTube and watching videos of the hurricanes in Texas and other places in the Caribbean. Incredible. You take one look at a hurricane and you know that God is powerful. One thoughtful look at a newborn baby and an understanding of the whole birth process and you know that God is intelligent beyond our comprehension. One thoughtful look peering into a microscope and you know, you could look at a microscope of, your, of a hair on your arm or at your shirt and you will see that God loves beauty and God loves order. It's there. One look into a microscope. The truth about God's goodness is equally obvious. You can see it in the rain that he chooses to have fall on those who are good and on those who are evil. You can see it in the sunshine that provides vitamin D to the godly and to the ungodly. You can see it in the food that grows, in the beauty of the world around us. You can see his goodness in the wonder of romance. You can see his goodness in the wonder of having children and grandchildren. Anyone can see it. Creation shouts the invisible attributes of God. Creation was never intended to point us back to a one-celled bowl of primordial soup, but instead to a generous, loving, beautiful God. God speaking. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being by Him. And then underlining, apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. There we go. God speaking. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. God speaking. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. That last statement here in Colossians you couldn't write a more comprehensive, a lawyer could not write a more comprehensive statement than that. The creation, everything that could possibly be was created by him. Time fails us this morning to go through the Psalms which proclaim his creation. Time fails us this morning to go through all the prophets where creation is proclaimed as a sovereign work of God. For example, have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Did you know that Jesus refers to each of the first seven chapters of Genesis himself? Did you know that the apostles proclaimed the creation of God? The early church proclaimed the creation of God. Every New Testament writer refers to these early chapters of Genesis. And finally, even up in heaven, even up in heaven, one day you and I will hear the angels, the elders, the saints, the martyrs, all believers proclaiming together these words. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? 
For you created all things, and by your will they existed and they were created. Genesis is history, plain and simple. Chapters 1 to 11, primitive history, creation, the fall, the flood, the dispersion. Chapters 12 to 50, patriarchal history, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. No one argues that 12 to 50 is not history. No one should argue that 1 to 11 isn't history either. Life is a multiple choice exam with just one question. And that one question has two options. Believe what Genesis says or don't believe what Genesis says and find yourself in a big problem in every way. I believe you will believe it. I pray that you will believe it. And I'm looking forward to next Sunday with Clarence Jansen to say a whole lot more. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, it is a joy to call you our Father, to have a personal relationship with you through Christ Jesus, our Savior, and to know that you are also the creator of everything that is, our very lives, this very universe, everything around us. We thank you that we can pause and take this moment to look at the book of origins and be astounded at all of the information you give us about where things began. All things, life, evil, language, nations, all of these things. We thank you, Lord, for the uniqueness of this incredible book of Genesis. We pray that you would build up our faith, build up our knowledge, build up our understanding in these days to come. We pray for your special blessing next Sunday as well on Clarence Jansen when he shares. And uh, we pray that you would fill us up with your word and with your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.